Amen. Amen. We are the people of a holy God, and God calls us to be imitators of his character given to us freely in Christ, our righteousness. Our scripture reading for today is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 20. So hear now God's holy word. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord. And will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual Immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 20. Apparently we had a little glitch on YouTube because of the Only a Holy God song, I guess. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, so we do have a streaming license uh, from CCLI for all the music that we stream. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the love that you've given to us. We thank you for the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We do pray that you would speak to us this morning through your word. As we look to your word, would you prepare our hearts to receive it, to love you, to know you better, to draw closer to you? And Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Of all the questions for us to try to figure out as human beings and as believers in this world, the question of identity is one of the most deep and profound and it is one of the most directly connected to our behavior, to the way we live our lives. The question of who we are determines how we live in many ways. And you know, the stereotypical images of the young person who sort of breaks away from parental tradition and from the structures in which they were raised and goes out to find themselves, right? And they want to know who they are. They're gonna go discover themselves. And so they become sort of adrift, right? Because this idea of if I don't know who I am, I don't know how I should behave. And if I don't want to identify with the things that my parents raised me to think about myself, then what is my behavior going to be? This, this ties in this idea of identity and behavior. But there's a third question that's tied into it because identity is not simply a matter of what we choose for ourselves or how we choose to identify ourselves. Identity is actually deeply tied into where we think we belong or to whom we think we belong. And so the question of who we are is intimately tied in with the question of whose we are. And then those two together shape 
really how we live, not just how we behave, but what we love, what we value, what we treasure, what we pursue, what we don't pursue, what we say yes to, what we say no to, what we place above another. So in marriages, for example, we see the fruit of this when, when, when uh, husband and wife become mother and father and they choose to see their role as parent, as being primary, and their role as spouse being secondary. They put the children and their needs above their marriage and its needs, and that's actually upside down. Um, the best thing that your parents, your children need from you is to see their parents who love each other well. And so you cannot be a faithful father and mother in a biblical home unless you're first loving your spouse. So that's an, an example of how we see this idea of identity and belongingness. Who do I belong to? Does my heart first belong to God and then my spouse and then my children? Or does my heart belong to my children first? Um, and I know it may seem like a weird thing to say on Mother's Day, but it's it's true. It's 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 the way God has created things, the way God's wired us up is is the way that we thrive, the way that we best function. One of the big lies that we face as American Christians living in our cultural context is the lie of autonomy. The idea that somehow we belong to ourselves, that somehow we can determine our identity for ourselves. We can choose like, like it's, you know, that game show where you get to choose door number one, door number two, door number three, let's make a deal, right? And we just get to choose, right? And of course there are consequences from those choices, but that's not actually true. We are not completely free and independent to just choose whatever we want to choose. And in fact, one of the reasons why our culture wants to sell us on that lie is that once we become detached from our moorings and we become sort of adrift on the sea of trying to discover ourselves, we become more vulnerable. We become more vulnerable to all sorts of snares, tricks, traps, right? It could be peer pressure, it could be political propaganda. It could be pervasive promotional advertising, but you become a, an easier sucker if you're groundless and you're adrift. And that's kind of the lie of American autonomy. I'm gonna determine for myself what's true. Well, then, you know, some lie comes along and it seems more plausible to you than if you had remained grounded in what God had given you. Of course, this trick, this tactic is not something unique to American culture. I say that we struggle with it as Americans, but the reality is that it's as old as human history itself. What was the original lie of the devil in the garden when he came to Adam and Eve? God's holding out on you. You don't need to find your identity in God. You don't need to find your identity in dependence upon God. You can eat this fruit and your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. And God doesn't want you to have this because he wants to keep you dependent upon himself. And here's your ticket to autonomy. Here's your ticket to true independence. Take this fruit and eat. And of course they did. And the actions had disastrous consequences for themselves and for all of humanity since then. And what Jesus said thousands of years later has been true ever since that first fateful day in the garden. Jesus said in John chapter 8, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. But then he goes on to say, The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And so if Jesus is correct, if the words that we read here in 1 Corinthians 6 are correct, indeed, if the word of God is correct, then when it comes to identity and belonging and behavior, the Bible presents us with two alternate realities. We are either slaves to sin, held captive by sin to do its will, or we are belonging to the Son. So who do you belong to? Do you belong to your sin or do you belong to the Son? In this passage, we see belonging to the Son most clearly at the beginning and at the end of the passage. So in verse 11, and then we see it again in verses 19 and 20. Verse 11 says, and such were some of you. Your previous identity as, you know, sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, etc. Such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You were made clean, 
You were set apart by God for God. You were declared right in the eyes of God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, by belonging to the Son and by the Spirit of our God. And if that's not clear enough, it becomes even more clear at the end of the passage, verses 19 to 20, that says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. In between these verses, verse 11 and verse 19 and 20, Paul lays out for us what it looks like to belong to God, what it looks like to glorify God in our bodies in two major areas of life. He's dealing with the areas of food and sex, sexual immorality, but really it can be applied to all areas of sort of moral indifference, areas of liberty, right? And then areas of morality, areas where God has said there is a clear right and wrong. But before we get into that section, I want to just review where we left off last week by looking again at verses 9 through 11. Verses 9 through 11 is, begins with Paul saying, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Throughout this chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul actually asks this do you not know question six times. Six times, do you not know? Do you not know? Now, when someone says, do you not know, they're not giving you new information, right? My uh, middle son is in sixth grade, okay? And I wouldn't come up to him and I wouldn't say, uh, do you not know? And some thing from algebra one or something from high school biology, because he doesn't know. Why would he know? He's in sixth grade, right? So when someone says, do you not know, what they're doing is they're reminding you of something that you should have known. And these are things that the Corinthians should have known because Paul taught them while he was among them. And he believes that Apollos would have carried the same message when he visited them later. These are foundational truths for the Christian life. And there are six do you not know questions. Let's look at them very quickly. The first two have to deal with the glorious destiny of believers. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? That's the, that's the glorious future destiny for believers, for saints. And then he asks a question about the kingdom of God and the future of the unrighteous. The third question, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? So about the future destiny of saints and about the future destiny of the unrighteous, unbelievers, and then three questions in our passage today, verses 15, 16, and 19, that have to do with our bodies and how we live out our lives in the here and now. First question, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Second question, do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? And the third question, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? So just if we just take these six do you not know questions, we can draw a line of connection from the glorious future that is promised to one group of people and the not so glorious future that is promised to another group of people. And that line connects to our identity. Are you a saint or are you an unrighteous? Are you a child of God or are you an unbeliever? And then that line from future destiny to our identity plays itself out in our present behavior. How do we live? In our bodies. And the concluding of the whole passage is, so glorify God in your body. Unlike the unrighteous, we who are saints will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, why will we? Is it because we're special? Is it because we're better than everybody else? No. Paul reminds us. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. And if you didn't fall into these categories of sin, there's some other category of sin that you fell into. Such were you. You were the unrighteous. You were the unbeliever and you were not going to inherit the kingdom of God because in and of ourselves, we don't deserve anything from God. We haven't given God anything to put him in debt to us. We haven't fulfilled any requirements that he set out for us that we should have earned anything from him. We don't 
deserve it. But, this glorious word, but the late R.C. Sproul said is the most important word in the Bible, the word but, B-U-T, but you were washed. Such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. We were all cleansed from our sin. The stain of sin removed from our souls. We were all set apart by God and made holy unto God. And we were all made right in God's sight. Not because of anything we've done. All the credit, all the praise, all the glory for achieving this goes to Jesus Christ. Because it is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that these things were applied to us by the Holy Spirit. Jesus satisfied the Father's will in everything he ever did. Jesus earned the kingdom of God for himself as the righteous king. Jesus fulfilled all the demands of the law perfectly in his own body. Jesus never sinned against God the Father in thought, word, or deed by anything that he left undone or by anything that he did that he should not have done. He was perfect and holy in all of his ways, and that is given to us. That is who we are. Now, if that is who we are, and it is given to us by grace, then how do we live in these bodies? We know that it's not our obedience that saves us. We know that in and of ourselves, we're no different from other people in the world, but we know there's been a profound and eternal change that's been worked in us by the Holy Spirit in the name of the Lord Jesus that should change how we live. How should we then live? Well, Paul breaks it down into two categories for us. The things that are lawful for us, and then the things that are immoral. Specifically, he's talking about food and sexual immorality. If you look at verses 12 and 13, he says, all things are lawful for me. This is how it starts. And it's in quotes twice, because this is a saying that was apparently circulating among the Corinthians. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. All things are lawful for me. I am redeemed. All things are lawful for me. This might have even been a saying that they got from Paul's teaching while Paul was among them. Paul taught them that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Paul taught them that Jesus, the Messiah, fulfilled the law for them. And so when they were asking questions about dietary requirements, food restrictions, clothing restrictions, holiness codes, sacrificial requirements, all of those aspects of the rules and regulations of the law of Moses that we could classify as ceremonial or cleanliness codes, Paul told them, all things are lawful for you. But they took it too far. They, they failed to see the distinction between the all things that are lawful and the things that are not lawful. Listen to how Paul responds to this. He says, all things are lawful for me, but then Paul reminds them, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but then Paul, using himself as an example, says, but I will not be I will not be dominated by anything. So Paul is telling them in these two verses about lawful things. He's not talking about all things, all things, okay? They were taking that too far. But we know that when Paul says all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful, all things are lawful, but I will not be dominated by anything. He's not here talking about things that are categorically immoral. You cannot imagine the Apostle Paul saying, murder is lawful for me, but it's not always helpful. Murder is lawful for me, but I'm not going to be dominated by murder. No, that's just, that's just ridiculous. That's absurd, right? So all things in verse 12 and 13 means all lawful things. And what Paul is doing is he is encouraging a sensible moderation in all lawful things. Because in the Roman Empire, gluttony and drunkenness were huge problems. And they still are in the world today. So gluttony, feasting to the point of making yourself sick, feasting to the point of damaging your body, being so gluttonous that you become 
uh, not very healthy, not very functional. That's not good, right? And so Paul says, that's not beneficial to you. And you don't want to be mastered by it. You don't want to get an addiction that gets a hold of you that you can't shake. So don't overindulge in lawful things, whether food or drink, to the point of letting them master you or letting them harm you. Not all things are beneficial and you are free to eat or drink whatever you want, but don't let them dominate you. And then in the middle of verse 13, Paul makes a transition. Verse 13, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both the one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Now, this transition is a little bit difficult to understand because there's a disagreement over how much of what Paul is saying at the beginning of verse 13 is a quote of a saying from the Corinthians or is not a quote. Now, I'll give you just a little bit of peek behind the curtains of translating the Bible. The original Greek manuscripts of the New Testament don't have quotation marks or any punctuation, really. And they also don't have any spaces between the words and all the letters are either all capital letters or all lowercase letters. So you can imagine if someone wrote something to you in English and it was put in all capital letters with no spaces between the words and no punctuation marks whatsoever, could you figure out what was being said? Well, yeah, probably, but it would take some doing. And without quotation marks, you wouldn't always know for sure what is a quote and what is not a quote. And that's what we're dealing with here in 1 Corinthians 6. So when you get to verse 13, here the ESV says, the quote is, food for the stomach and the stomach for food. Right? Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. That's the quote from the Corinthians. If you look at other translations like the NIV, they have the quote being a little bit more expanded. They have the quote being, um, let's see if I can find my notes here, in the NIV, Food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. So, in other words, it, the quote from the Corinthians would have included all of it. Food for the stomach, the stomach for food, God will destroy them both. There's actually a third option, and that is that this isn't even a quote from the Corinthians at all. This is just something Paul is saying. Yeah, food is made for the stomach, the stomach is made for food, and God will destroy them both. There is a sense in which what Paul is saying here is, look, it's right to eat food, because food was created by God to be eaten by your stomach, and your stomach was created by God to eat food. Now, that may seem rather obvious, and yet we shouldn't be dominated by it. Some people are absolutely dominated by food, and that's wrong because food is just made for your stomach, not to be your Lord and master. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul talks about a group of people whose God is their belly. And he uses pretty strong language about them. He says, Philippians 3, verses 18 to 20, For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So even though food is made for the stomach and the stomach is made for food, and if you're hungry, you can eat, and you can eat freely with freedom that Christ has secured for you, don't become dominated. Don't let your God, don't let your belly become your God so that it masters you. Because food is a very good thing to put into a hungry stomach, but it's a very bad thing to have rule your life. And if you're honest, you can look around at our culture and see all sorts of ways in which people have made food into an idol. Some have gone down the dietary track of saying, basically, this particular diet and this particular restriction is the ticket to a good life. You're going to have a great life if you just eat this way, right? And other people are like, well, I'm going to eat as much as I want to and just completely overindulge to the point of being unhealthy. And Paul is telling us when it comes to food, you are free, but don't abuse your freedom. And more importantly, don't yet let your freedom abuse you, enslave you, trap you make you unhealthy, make you a puppet or a subject. But the important thing in verse 13 is the transition from talking about food for the stomach, the stomach for food, and then talking about the body. It may be true that food's for the stomach and the stomach's for food, but the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. 
Now, to understand this, we have to understand a little bit more about what the culture would have been like in Corinth. In Corinth, there were markets, and in the markets, there was sold meat. When we get to chapter 10, we're going to be revisiting this idea of food that is sold, meat that is sold in the meat markets. Paul has told them, and he's going to tell them again in chapter 10, look, go to the meat market and eat whatever you want. Eat whatever's for sale and don't ask any questions and don't worry about it because all food is clean for those who belong to Christ. There's freedom there, right? Go ahead. Go to the meat market. Enjoy yourself, right? Have a ham sandwich. Have a pork chop. Have some cream of crab soup. Enjoy a lobster tail. You're free in Christ. Well, those same people would have realized that some of that meat offered in the market was offered up as a pagan sacrifice, and then it was sold in the market. In fact, it's a very common thing to do if you're a meat merchant and you want your little god to bless your business. You offer up your, your meat, your animal, your cow, your pig, whatever, as a sacrifice, and then you offer it for sale in the meat market. And Paul's going to say again later, it doesn't matter. There's really only one true God, so go ahead and eat with freedom. Don't ask any questions about it, right? Don't make a big deal out of it. Well, then these same people were thinking, well, if I'm free to go to the meat market to satisfy the hunger of my stomach, there's another meat market in Corinth where prostitutes come. Female prostitutes from the temple of Aphrodite and male prostitutes from the temple of Apollo. Can I just go there to satisfy other hungers that my body might have? And Paul says, no, like, no, what are you thinking, right? So if I could summarize Paul's teaching here, it's this. If you don't know the difference between a pork chop and a prostitute, you've got serious problems. And this may seem silly, but this is really the kind of distinction that Christians have continually failed to make in how we live our lives. So getting beyond the idea of pork chops and prostitutes, let's go to a different direction. Let's go to things that we in the history of American Christianity have been tripped up about. We're free to eat whatever category of food we want to eat. You can get the pork rinds, even the spicy ones, and you can eat those. You're free to eat those, right? You're also free to play cards if you want to. You're free to dance if you want to. You're free to listen to that rock and roll music if you want to. You're free to um, have alcoholic beverage in moderation, right? But with all of these things, Paul's advice for all of these things is, all these things are lawful for you. Cards, dancing, moderate consumption of alcohol, food, right? Rock and roll music. They're all free to you, but yet they're not all beneficial, okay? You don't want to go out to the dance clubs because a lot of those are just not really helpful places to be, right? And, and you shouldn't let any of them dominate you. If you, if you develop a, a gambling habit, you start gambling when you're playing cards and you get hooked on it and it starts to, that's not good. Like, that's not good. So in areas of freedom, in areas where we have liberty, the watchword is wisdom. Not everything's going to be helpful for you, and not everything is safe because it might come to dominate you. You have to know yourself. You have to know whether you have a problem with alcohol, whether you have a problem with gaming, whether you have a problem with these sorts of things that might gain a hold of you. Now, gambling itself is just a cheater system where they're just stealing your money. So I'd stay away from it entirely. But again, <coughs> these are, you know, if you wanted to play a little poker game with your friends and penny poker or something like that, you're free to do that. But a lot of Christians have said, no, 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 no. You can't do that, right? Put down that pork chop sandwich, you know, put down that, that poker game. Turn off that rock and roll music. It's the devil's music, right? ladies, you can only wear dresses, right? I mean, we've, this is not, I wish I was making this up, but I'm not making it up because people have done it, right? Some people think the only way to be faithful to Christ is to not have electricity in your house. Those, that's legalism. That's not liberty. That's legalism. And there's actually a, a sense in which if we give in to legalism, it stokes the fire of rebellion in our hearts because it feels like God's just a killjoy. God never wants me to have any fun. If there's anything that might make you laugh or enjoy yourself, you better not do it, 
right? Because God might get upset with you. And so we become the sucking on a lemon, sour-faced believers. And, and, and children who grow up in that environment are like, God's just a killjoy. There's no fun in being a Christian at all. And so it stokes the fires of rebellion. And so in response to that, other Christians have said things like, well, if you're set free by Christ, you're free to sin. Sin away. No big deal. You're free in Christ. Oh, it's all forgiven anyway. Don't worry about it. Well, that's also wrong. Sin is never okay. It's always displeasing to God, and it's always harmful to us and to those around us. So Paul uses the example of sexual immorality, which is a particularly bad kind of sin, and we'll see why in a minute. But this can apply to all areas of clear immoral behavior. Things that are forbidden by the Ten Commandments, things that fit into this category of, you know, adulterers, idolaters, those who practice homosexuality, thieves, the greedy, drunkards. Like, it's not okay to pickpocket people a little bit, right? Like, you could develop a skill of picking people's pockets and say, I'm going to go on the New York City subway and I'm just going to pickpocket like 10 people. You know, I'm just going to take like a couple hundred dollars. But uh, within moderation, I won't let it get a control of me. No, like you can't do that. That's wrong. That's thieving. That's stealing. Or I'm just going to shoplift small items from the convenience store. No, that's stealing. It's just wrong, right? So that's how Paul is helping us navigate issues of liberty and issues of morality. So let's see, he builds a three-point argument very quickly on why sexual immorality is not in the same category as food freedom. First of all, there is a sense in which the hunger of our stomach was made to be satisfied with food, and food was made to satisfy that hunger. But Paul says the body was not created by God for sexual immorality. That's not God's creation design. God didn't make your body for sexual immorality the way that he made your stomach for food. Your body was made to serve the Lord. Your hunger, your longings are made to be used in service to God, harnessed in service to God. Secondly, he says, your bodies are members of Christ. And here his language is very visceral. We are the limbs and organs of Jesus in this world. We are the physical members of the body of Christ. We are his hands, we are his feet, we are his eyes and ears. We are the body of Christ in the world. Well, can I then take a member of the body of Christ, Christ's own body, and unite it to a prostitute? No way! Like, that is, that is wrong, that is disgusting, that is blasphemous, that is completely forbidden. You are a member of the body of Christ. Your body is an extension of Christ's body in the world. You can't take it and unite it to a prostitute. That's just wrong. And then the third one is this. Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. And here Paul gets into a profound truth that is unique to the sexual union, to sexual immorality. Sexual immorality creates a sexual union between man and woman. It is a one flesh bond. The two will become one flesh. And that is why God has said that the sexual union is only to take place in the context of marriage. God doesn't say that because God is anti-sex. Christians don't believe in sexual purity because we are prudes and we have a low view of sex. Rather, it's because we have a high view that the sexual union is stronger and more powerful than the world thinks. It's not a casual throwaway thing. It creates a one flesh relationship between the two partners in the sexual union. Whether we acknowledge it or not, it is real. It is true. That's what God created it to do. And so to overly indulge in that, to put it outside of the bounds of marriage, to be with a prostitute is just wrong. It creates something that is that is completely contrary to what God's purpose is for our bodies and for sexual activity. And so once we understand these three things, right, that our sexual appetites are not like our hunger for food, that our bodies are members of the body of Christ, and that, to, and that sexual immorality creates a sexual union, once we understand these three things, Paul's conclusion then is there's only one thing to do regarding sexual immorality, and that is flee. Flee from 
sexual immorality. Run away from it. Get away from it. It is dangerous. And then he says, every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. And I know some people will come back and say, well, wait a minute. Gluttony and drunkenness are also against your own body, aren't they? I mean, overindulging in food and getting drunk, isn't that also against your body? Not in the same way that sexual immorality is because of that union. Because of the physical one flesh union that's created, sexual sins are in a different category. They are in a different category. And they are to be taken more seriously. And again, it's not because we have a low view, but a high view of the preciousness of the sexual union that God has given for husband and wife in marriage, where it is to be enjoyed as a beautiful expression of a true commitment that has been made and a true union that has been made before God. So ultimately, Paul says, we cannot give ourselves to sexual immorality, to illicit unions, or to any other kind of immoral practice in our bodies for one overarching reality. And this is how he concludes this chapter. He says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. You, believer, were bought by God with a price, the precious, priceless price of the blood of his Son. He purchased you for himself. And this is counter to a false view of Christian freedom that is circulating out there, even in some evangelical circles, that says basically Christ set you free so that you can belong to yourself and be your own master. Do your own thing. If it makes you happy, go for it. That is not Christian freedom. It's not what the Bible teaches about Christian freedom at all. The Bible teaches that God redeemed us from a slavery to sin to make us his slaves forever. And that's a privilege. You see, in the Roman world, most of the population were actually slaves in most parts of the Roman world. But the condition of a slave was a greatly varied life depending upon two major things, depending on the status of your master and depending on the privileges that your master gave you. So you could have an absolutely horrible life as a Roman slave or you could have a life of privilege and freedom depending on the status of your master and the privileges your master gave you. And here's what the Bible teaches us. By nature, we are slaves to sin. So our natural master is sin. And how does he treat us? Well, the wages of sin is death. What he pays us for our service to him is death. Christ redeems us out of that slavery to make us a slave of the Most High God, to make us his own precious possession. So now we go from having sin as our master to having the God of the universe as our master and the God of the universe who purchases us, us to be his slaves also adopts us to be his sons and daughters forever. So we're given the highest privileges, an inheritance. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. We are given the kingdom. The story is like this. A king ruled over a large empire. Part of that empire rebelled against him. Under a petty duke who hated the king and who led an insurrection against the king. And so he gained a following. And like the evil dukes who rise up against their good kings, he was a jerk. And he abused the people who, treat, who followed him in his army. He abused them. He starved them. He, he mocked them. He ridiculed them. He enslaved them with the harshest type conditions. There's a battle. The great king wins the battle. He defeats the evil duke who was in rebellion against him. And all of those who were in, under the duke's domain are freed. And the king now says, you are free to come serve me. And if we'll come serve me, I will bring you into my household and I will make you my sons and daughters and I will give you the inheritance of my kingdom along with my rightful son, the crown prince. 
That is the highest privilege. And what did we do to deserve it? Nothing. We were following the evil duke. We were in rebellion. We were fighting in the war against our good king. And yet our good king says to us, I love you. I have made you my own. You are free to serve me. And as you serve me, you do so not only as my slaves and servants, but also as my sons and daughters who are given the kingdom. But we are not set free to go off and be our own masters. There is no such thing. To go out and be your own master is to put yourself under the slavery to sin again, whose wages are death. So for us as believers, we have a changed identity. It's an identity that's been changed by the Lord Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. We are washed, we are sanctified, we are justified, we are given the kingdom of God, we are a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in us, whom we have from God. So how do we live? Glorify God in your body. How do we live? Walk in the Spirit, bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Live as children of light, who were called out of darkness and into his glorious light. Live out who God has made you to be. Now, I do feel the need to say one more thing before we close, and that is, this is not a call to perfectionism. Please don't hear anything that Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 6, or anything I'm saying to you, as a call to perfectionism. Perfectionism is a deadly poison. What do I mean by perfectionism? It's the idea that if you're a Christian, you would never sin. You would somehow reach a state of sin-free perfection in this life. And that is a deadly trap, because that can only lead you to one of two places. If you believe that by even by walking in the Spirit, even by living by the grace of God, even not through your own strength, you can get to a place where you are sin-free in this life, you are perfect in this life, you're only going to end up in one of two places, I guarantee it. You're either going to end up in self-righteous arrogance because you think you arrived at that place of perfection and you didn't really, but you end up self-righteously arrogant. I've arrived. I did it. Why can't you? Or you end up in a place of absolute self-loathing despair because you know you haven't reached perfection and you think that you should be able to. So this is not perfectionism. We continue to sin. We continue to need forgiveness. We continue to need to confess our sins and to receive forgiveness on an ongoing basis every day. But that is part of the greatness of the gospel is that God loves us. We are children of God. My children are not perfect. They may be shocked to hear me say that. But my children are not perfect. I'm not perfect. How many times a day do, I, do my children mess up and do something different than what I would want them to do? I don't know. I don't keep track, right? How many times do I every day mess up and not do things that my heavenly father would want me to do? I don't know. He doesn't keep track. Praise the Lord. But I do still call my children to obedience, but they know that I love them, that my love for them is not conditioned on their obedience, but it also doesn't mean they can just live however they want to live. We are children of God. We are children of light. We are not perfect in this life, but we are dearly loved and we are called to respond and walk in that love. Freedom in the areas where Christ has set us free. Obedience in the areas where Christ calls us to obedience. Living as God's holy people. So glorify God in your body. In the end, what this truth is, is that the gospel of grace doesn't just change our eternal destiny. It changes everything. It changes our entire lives, the way we think about ourselves, the way we see ourselves, the way we see the world, the way we approach God, the choices we make and why we make those choices. Everything is transformed by the gospel of grace for the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, we are your dearly loved children. Sometimes we don't even believe that, if we're honest. We think we're just a bunch of failures who you tolerate. We are not a bunch of failures who you tolerate. You're, we're a bunch of failures who you love and you love dearly and you love deeply and you love enough that you gave your son for us and you welcome us and you embrace us and you 
cheer us on and you encourage us and you strengthen us and you protect us and you are for us. Help us to believe that because that's what motivates us to true heartfelt obedience. Not the idea that if we mess up too bad, you're going to take us out to the woodshed and give us a whooping, but the fact that you love us and you are for us and you are in us and you are with us. So help us walk in love, even as we have been loved. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.